Welcome to the verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Romans. We shall finish chapter 1 today. Last week we examined the beautiful message of God's gospel. Today the author will offer sober warning about what happens when we reject that gift. The wrath, the judgment of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth of God's love and wisdom by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. You know, we unfortunately do not speak much about the wrath of God. We hear more about God's love, His patience, His grace. Not so much about his justice. Like any loving parent, God will address destructive behavior. He will administer tough love. So how does he do that? Verses 24, 26, and 28 will tell us. It will read that he gives us over, gives us over to our wickedness. Which means that he'll allow for us to reap what we sow, to experience the consequences of sin. The verse is saying that no matter how much we attempt to suppress, deny, ignore, attempt to intellectually rationalize or justify our sin by calling it calling evil good, God has plainly warned that sin will always, always have devastating consequences. Paul continues with verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse, without excuse. Even the most ardent atheist, scientist, agree that the universe did indeed have a beginning. It is expanding, and it operates with precision. The Big Bang Theory argues that a dense ball of energy or power exploded and started all of creation. Yet scientists cannot explain where this power came from, nor what caused the explosion, or why there's such precision of design and order within our universe, down to the tiniest living cell. In fact, scientists cannot even duplicate that tiny cell because of its infinite complexity. So Paul argues like Newton, no matter how much we may wish to reject the idea of a creator, there really is, we are really left with no excuse when we look at the world around us. He continues in verse 21, For although they knew God, Neither, they neither glorified, meaning gave value to God, gave value to him as God, nor gave thanks, appreciation to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul's argument is that deep down, we inherently know that there is a God. And spiritually, we have this quiet voice in our hearts that speaks to us. Yet many have chosen to ignore that voice and, and judge God as having no value, no purpose in our lives and having no appreciation for the many, many blessings that he gives us. Instead, we devote both our mind and our appreciation to that which is called futile, which in the Greek means we've chosen to trust in substitutes or idols rather than God. John Calvin said man is good at attempting to manufacture new substitutes, new idols. Pascal said we all have a place in our hearts that only God can fill. Other substitutes will never satisfy. Now in verse 22, Paul continues, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged, substituted the glory, the value of of the immortal God for images, idols, made to look like 
a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Man's rejection of God began all the way back to Adam and Eve when they chose to value the tr- to value and trust in the wisdom of a serpent, a snake, rather than God. Or likewise, the Israelites chose to value, to worship a man-made golden calf rather than God. The theologian Tim Keller defines an idol as anything, anything that we value more than God. And the poet Emerson got it right when he warned, be careful in the gods or the idols that we choose to worship because they will shape our character. Paul likewise warns, therefore God gave or gives them over in their sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchange, they substitute the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. So, we have this sober warning to be careful what we substitute for God, what we wish for, what we lust for. Because if we continue to, to reject, defy God and His wisdom, He will allow us to be given over to that which we crave. Paul offers an example of sexual sin. If we choose pornography, adultery, promiscuity, the warning is that that will lead to a wasted life of heartache and headache versus God's peace, his joy, and his purpose for us. Paul continues with other examples. Because of this, because of that choice of rejecting God, God gave them over, gave them over, to their shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relationships for an unnatural one. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the wisdom, the knowledge of God. So God, again, gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they ought not to be done. Do what ought not to be done. God gives each of us free will to make our own decisions about our bodies and about our behavior. But our choice Our choices do not change God's order and human design. Human life still depends on this exchange of natural relationships between a man and a woman. And his wisdom teaches that that should happen within the special bonds of a marriage. Society is beginning to reject this notion, this institution of marriage, this godly ordained marriage. Yet, Social scientists will tell us, confirm that marriage produces the highest probability of reducing poverty, longer life in the, in the couples themselves, better outcomes for children, and better outcomes for the communities. As a society, as our societies have begun to reject God, we have seen a rapid rise in the unmarried birth rate in both the United States and other Western countries. This unwise choice breaks God's heart because of the struggle it creates. It places on especially women and children. A society begins to reject God and therefore his wisdom, and it will leave a void. And sadly, that void is, will be filled by the culture of the media, the culture of power, the culture of politicians. They are left to define right and wrong for a society. When that happens, a society begins to view any amoral behavior as acceptable, even right, because they are more fearful of being called intolerant, judgmental, than the consequences of those sin. The moral fabric of a society begins to deteriorate. Civil decourse becomes more coarse. The rule of law is challenged. Qualities of hope 
love, trust, optimism begin to suffer. Now Paul will list some of the other outcomes from this decision about rejecting God's right and wrong. They have become or will become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Now he'll close the chapter with, Although they know God's righteous decrees, they know God's righteous decree, that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Paul is saying that we all have been blessed with this beautiful gift of a God-given conscience of right and wrong, a moral compass that, is an, that inherently knows God's righteous decrees. It knows it's wrong to steal, to lie, to murder, to slander, to harm others, especially the weak and the innocent. But the warning is the more we override, reject this conscience, the easier it becomes. Scripture calls it quenching the spirit, quenching the light of God. But his loving encouragement is not to allow that light to be given over, given over to the darkness. That ends chapter 1. We'll begin chapter 2 next week. Until then, may God bless you and bless your family with both his grace and his peace. Aloha.